And starting the webinar now. Here we go. Welcome, everybody. We're just going to let uh, folks come in um, over the next minute or so, and then we'll get started. You could grab a glass of water or a cup of coffee or, or um, make yourself comfortable. are coming in. Okay. Well, it's 12.01, so I'm going to um, get started and um, just want to welcome everybody today to the uh, PSU Future Collaboratory's fourth and final Future of Work webinar for the 2020-2021 academic year. We're so appreciative of you joining us today and extend a hearty welcome to everyone from PSU, as well as guests from around the country and around the world. I'm Sally Mudiamu, a PSU Futures Fellow and Director of International Partnerships in the Office of International Affairs. I'm a foresight practitioner in the field of digital and virtual global engagement. And I believe that the future of work is deeply connected to this domain. I'm proud of how my field of international education in particular and internationalization at home prepares our graduates for the future of work. I want to also thank my partner and co-creator of this webinar series, Dr. Laura Nissen, leader of the PSU Futures Collaboratory, Presidential Futures Fellow, Professor of Social Work, and a Research Fellow at the Institute for the Future. Many thanks to Mr. David Burrow and his assistant, Mr. Pejan, for helping us today with the technical aspects of this event. What has brought all of us here today is a belief that the future of work is beckoning and has even accelerated over the past 15 months and that we can and should participate in a co-creation of a future of work that aligns with the needs of society that demands a more equitable outcome in both higher education and in work. Before we get going with our stellar group of PSU speakers today, I'd like to share a brief bit of background about the PSU Futures Collaboratory for those who are just learning about us. The PSU Futures Collaboratory was established in 2019 by then acting president Stephen Percy to serve as a place where people from across our campus could join in the experimental and improvisational space to explore the, top, the topic of the future writ large and build the collective skill of foresight. It was the brainchild of Dr. Laura Nissen, my co-creator of the series, who has brought in a wide array of renowned and thoughtful futures thinkers and practitioners to talk to our collaboratory, including Afrofuturists, writers, community leaders, researchers, activists, educators, and scholars, all of whom work to explicitly shape a better and more equitable collective future. From them, we have learned a variety of foresight tools and frameworks and are actively applying these tools to real world, world challenges we have at PSU. The PSU Futures Collaboratory has been invited into, into spaces all over campus to share what we've been learning and practicing to both democratize foresight tools and encourage more of a long-term view of the challenges that we face. Our goal has build, been to build capacity for collective imagination, agility, and intelligence to the very real challenges we face as an academic community. Our values center on expanding access and, and success to students throughout our region with issues of justice and equity prioritized with attention to longstanding structural barriers to BIPOC, BIPOC and other minoritized student groups, as well as fulfilling PSU's mission to serve the city. Foresight practice is always a balance of simultaneously assessing threats to our future while co-creating the futures that we most want. Our motto for the collaboratory has been the future is plural because so much is still possible. The future is not set. We assume we will occupy an increasingly complex space as a public university and we are actively envisioning what being ready for the future means to us collectively. 
please visit our website. Please visit our website to see more about what we've been doing this year. And we invite you into dialogue by looking at our three big questions for the future. And I can also say that um, the website now has all of the previous webinars on them if, you're, if you wanna check those out. The future of work in many respects is a story about equity, justice, human rights, human agency, and the future of well being. Sometimes the future of work discourse is pitted against the future of higher education discourse. This is a problem and has long standing tensions that need to be acknowledged. Our purpose today is in showing how linked and connected these two topics are particularly for a university in which so many of our students are invested deeply in experiencing their own economic mobility and agency as a result of their educations. What must we as a university learn about the changing pathways to the future of work and to meaningful equitable career trajectories to be effective in serving our students in the coming years? How can these lessons make us better and stronger as a university? without compromising our values and ideals as educators? How are universities themselves calibrating to provide the best possible connections to a successful future for students given the ever evolving landscape of the future of work? And what do students think that they need most in order to navigate emerging careers? We have four panelists today from Portland State to offer a PSU and a university perspective. They will share with what has most resonated with them from the first three webinars and describe what PSU is doing to help students participate in, be successful in, and also shape the future of work. First, I'd like to introduce Susan Jeffers, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. Dr. Jeffers joined Portland State University in 2018 as Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. She served previously in numerous roles at the University of Washington, including department chair, vice provost for global affairs, and vice chancellor for academic affairs at the University of Washington Bothell. She is particularly committed to increasing opportunities for more diverse and underrepresented communities to participate actively in higher education, including expanding opportunities for international and community engagement. Next, I'd like to introduce Amy Lambert, Vice President for Global Diversity and Inclusion. Dr. Lambert joined PSU in August 2020 from Roger Williams University in Rhode Island, where she served as the Vice President for Equity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer, ensuring that equity was embedded into all university operations. Dr. Lambert's goal at Portland State is to close the gap between potential and thriving for students and the university as a whole. Dr. Lambert is the senior officer responsible for the important work of promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion across the campus and in the greater community through strategic planning, collaboration, and innovation. Our next speaker is Greg Flores, Associate Director of Career Services in the University Career Center. Mr. Flores is 19 years in the field, coalesces around his mission to bring job readiness and career development opportunities to as many students and alumni as possible. He believes that career development belongs as a central component of all academic programs and that faculty can improve employment outcomes for their students by encouraging student exploration and reflection on career goals. Mr. Flores has written extensively on developing internships and co-ops as part of the undergraduate and graduate experience. Our fourth speaker is Dr. Laura Bernie Nissen, founder of the PSU Futures Collaboratory and Presidential Futures Fellow. Dr. Nissen has been at PSU since 2000 and is a social work professor, leader, researcher, and activist focused on innovation and in public sector human service, equity work, human rights, and social justice future issues. She is particularly interested in how acceleration in climate change, artificial intelligence, intelligence, technology, and economic disparities are impacting and will continue to impact vulnerable populations. And how urgent contemporary human service systems need to evolve to meet the challenges of a complex and uncertain future. Dr. Nissen is engaged 
and focused on the future of higher education, particularly in the public sector. Her focus is on building collaborative intelligence, imagination, and agility for a complex era, and preparing systems and people who rely and work with them to meet the challenges of the times ahead. As a professional foresight practitioner, she has both a senior capstone and graduate certificate in future studies in process of development at PSU. At the conclusion of our speaker's remarks, we'll be joined by two PSU respondents. Jeannie Enders is a social and organizational psychologist teaching in both the undergraduate and graduate programs in the School of Business at Portland State. At PSU, Dr. Enders has served in several roles as an adjunct faculty member, fixed term assistant professor, associate dean of undergraduate programs, executive director of the School of Business Online Initiatives, and again, as assistant professor in the management area of the School of Business. Her areas of interest include the umbrella concepts of meaning and happiness in work settings and innovation in work organizations and in teaching and learning. Dr. Enders is committed to work that explores and disseminates research that relate to happier, more meaningful workplaces. Our student respondent is Kim Valentine, a future certified public accountant and a student in the Master of Taxation program graduating in 2022. Her professional background is in accounting and taxation. As a non-traditional student, Ms. Valentine is particularly concerned about how university prepares those like her who have returned to school midlife to advance their careers. As the mother, also as the mother of sons who are in college, she is concerned as a parent whether or not they're going to get those first important, those important first jobs after graduation and how universities are preparing students for the ever evolving future of work. After our panelists pose their questions to our speakers, then it will be your turn. Please use the Q&A function for your questions since that's where I'll be pulling them from. However, use the chat function to share your thoughts and responses in real time. So, Let's begin. I would like to invite our provost, Susan Jeffords, to share her reflections and observations. Thank you. Thank you, Sally, and welcome to everybody who is participating in this conversation. I'm really looking forward to hearing the reflections and thoughts that all of you have on this very exciting um, and provocative topic of the future of work. I want to give uh, an expression of gratitude to Laura Nissen for continuing to create spaces at PSU in which we can have these kinds of conversations and we can begin to think constructively and collectively about the future we want uh, for this university and for the students and the communities that we serve. So, Laura, I continue to be grateful for your leadership in, in helping us have these conversations. Um, I thought the speakers and the series were fabulous. I kept having a brain moment of, wow, that's amazing, and wanting to just stop and think about something. And the speaker was going on to yet some other really interesting idea. So um, I encourage those of you who haven't had a chance to see all of the webinars to really um, take a few minutes and watch them because I found them incredibly thought provoking. I continue to um, ruminate about a lot of what I saw there. When I think about the future of work and the context of the conversations that were started by our guest speakers, uh, I think that there are two ways in which um, I want to think about this. One of those is as we think about the degree programs we offer, the curricula that we offer, the structure of support programs that we offer for our students to prepare them for the future of work. But I also think about it as we reflect on our own work, how we work together as an institution. If nothing, the pandemic has showed us that we can work differently whether we went willingly into that experience or not, we all participated in a great national experiment about how we can work differently if needed. And now we face an opportunity to have a conversation about how we can work differently if we choose. And 
I believe from things I've heard from many of you that many of you choose to continue to work in some of the ways that we have learned over the last year. And I think as an institution, it behooves us to think about as a community, how can we support each other most effectively to take uh, learnings from what we've had uh, over the last year about how we can work together, how we can support each other effectively, and indeed how we can support our students effectively. I've heard from a number of students who have said that they really valued having an opportunity to connect with folks remotely uh, without having to come to campus for an appointment or to get a question answered. I would hope that we would want to keep some of these uh, modalities available as we can continue to think about how to serve our students. But I also have heard from a number of faculty and staff at PSU that they have enjoyed having a flexibility in the way in which they engage with the work responsibilities that we all have. I, for example, am on a vacation in Northern California and I'm participating in a conversation about the world of work. Would I like to work forever from Northern California? Now there's an interesting idea that's worth pursuing. But just having this flexibility to be able to participate in important university conversations without having to be physically on the campus is something that I think we all have come to value and want to think about how to incorporate that in our lives. Mostly though, when I think about this conversation, I think about what our students want. And what they want is in seeking a PSU degree is to have a credential that gives them an opportunity to have successful and prosperous lives going forward. And it's our responsibility as educators, all of us, to make sure that we're doing that for our students, that we're not providing them with um, an educational environment that will be outdated very soon by a very rapidly changing world. And in order to do that, we ourselves have to continue to be abreast of those changes. And I think this lecture series has provided us a wonderful opportunity to think about that. But we have to start saying to ourselves, what is the world our students will face five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and how can they look back on their PSU experience and say that what I learned at PSU has prepared me for what I'm doing now without having to feel like, oh, I wish I'd learned something else or I have to go back. But can we give them that flexibility and that, uh, that platform through which they can continue not only to be successful, but to provide leadership as the world around them changes? Because I think we all know that the world around us desperately needs the voices of the students that we serve in order to address the challenges that we face. One of the things I most appreciated uh, from one of the speakers who said the future of work is already here. We just haven't acknowledged it. So this isn't what I, one of the things I learned was that this isn't a speculative conversation. It's a real conversation and we need to embrace it. Um, and to do that, with enthusiasm and curiosity in a way that enables us to um, to really think about the future of work that is that is here right now. I also liked enormously uh, one of the comments that talked about how we're in the shift from skilling to cultivating human capability. At some level, I think all of us who are educators would say, we hope we've always been in the business of cultivating human capability. But I think um, I take ownership and responsibility for saying, am I constantly willing to challenge my own assumptions about what that means? Certainly what I thought that meant when I first became an assistant professor is very different than what I think that means now. But I think we have responsibilities to constantly question ourselves and say, are my assumptions true now? Do they continue to obtain or do I need to re-examine my assumptions? And I think the, the spaces, Laura, that you're helping us to create here, I hope will continue as an institution to give us a chance to continue to 
challenge those assumptions. One of the other things I appreciated was a comment about going from scalable efficiency to scalable adaptation. What I heard from all the speakers was the words adaptation and flexibility. And so my hope for PSU is that we could become a model nationally for an institution that embraces adaptation and flexibility as part of how we work. That we won't rest easily on saying, well, we solved that problem and we don't have to look at it anymore. But that we will recognize and feel comfortable in a space that says, we need constantly to adapt, we need to be flexible, um, and we need to do that on behalf of serving our students and communities because they are going to be required by the changing world of work to adapt and be flexible. And we wanna be their partners in that. But that means that we ourselves have to do that. What does it mean to be an adaptive institution? I don't have an answer for that, but I would love for us as a university to say that we've thought about that and we actually do have an answer and that we can uh, model what that looks like, not only for other universities, but for companies, for city governments, for other organizations around us. I would love for that to become one of the areas of distinction of which we would speak with pride about Portland State. Sally, I think I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Oops, thank you very much. Um, Ame, would you please, uh, we'd love to have your remarks next. Sure. Um, good afternoon. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, Thank you uh, for the invitation. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, shout out to Laura and Sally and the Futures Collaboratory and all of my, my uh, fellow panelists and, and those who are listening in. Um, I just appreciate the, the work that's happening. I appreciate the, uh, I really enjoyed the series. And so um, I'm stealing Laura's uh, idea of looking back to look forward uh, in these remarks. And, um, you know, in terms of what resonated the most for me in the sessions, this was kind of my primary takeaway, right? That people are talking about this. Um, and I'm gonna now, you know, I throw that out there and I'm gonna now unpack what I mean, right? Um, and on, I sent it to Lori yesterday. Uh, um, I started at PSU on August uh, 24th, 2020, but I had worked, uh, kind of started my engagement in the summer. And so I sent this email, uh, Laura was nice enough uh, to um, give me recommendations of places to go kind of get some R&R &R before I started work. And so I was in Cannon Beach and we were emailing and I sent this to, to Laura on August 20th, right? And I talked about this nascent passion project uh, about automation and the impact that automation would have on minoritized communities. Uh, and, you know, when you think about demographic shifts and uh, intersect that with current disparities, right? It's, you know, it's, we should be concerned, right? And we, we should realize that if we don't take intentional action right now, uh, our future would be like our present or even worse, right? And which is not our, our that's not the equitable future that we're all hoping for, right? And so, you know, the, the question of, and Provost Jeff has alluded to this. I would expect uh, that Mr. Flores would talk to this, talk about this. What if um, we are right now coming alongside minoritized folks and um, equipping folks with capacities to lead the future, right? And so um, this is the time to do it. And so in addition to the conversations that we are having and need to be having around kind of navigation and, and navigating in a system that wasn't built for minoritized folks, all of the unwritten rules and processes that keep people out and prevent their thriving. What about if we intentionally layer this on, right? And you know, this is what I say at the end, right? That lots, I have a lot to learn about this and lots of players are needed at the table, but it's, just an, it's an idea I can't shake and it's work I want to do. And I will say today that it's work I have to do 
uh, in addition to all the other things, right? The uh, never ending list of things that we have to get done. So, you know, um, when, I, when I think about these kind of resonant themes, right? And so it was just, it was super exciting to just have these opportunities to hear from brilliant folks talking about the, the thing I'm increasingly passionate about. Uh, and so the fact that when we think about the future, right? The future of work, the future of racial justice, the future of the racial wealth gap, the future of the thriving of BIPOC communities and the future of work are super interconnected, right? And so I just really appreciated hearing, I loved, I loved all of the sessions, but just hearing about conversations happening in the state and the city were really helpful uh, because those are places to connect. Um, and then, you know, the questions that I walked away with are, you know, what about who's leading action, right? Like really wonderful conversations happening, wonderful recommendations uh, on the table. And I, I need to find my way to connect to, to those, but like who's leading the action per, uh, purpose, right? And so if we're talking about it at, at PSU as we should, if folks are talking about it at the state level, if folks are talking about it in the city, then how do we kind of align resources and how do we scale and amplify action, right? And so, and then, you know, the conversation we're having here today is what's our role in this, right? As an anchor institution, um, what's, what's our role in, in driving action, in convening conversations as Laura and Sally have done, um, you know, and kind of making sure that something sustainable happens. And so it, uh, going back to the looking back to look forward idea, my first board presentation, I talked about some of this. And so rather than reinventing the wheel, it was an opportunity to go back to this and, you know, actually hold myself accountable. Like, okay, I put all these things on the table. I think it was in September or early October. What does that mean right now uh, in May, uh, uh, several months later? And so, you know, this, the idea from my perspective is that there's an opportunity for us to embrace our role in the city, in the state, in the region, and as Provost Jeffords was saying, like nationally. And, you know, having a president who has made these three critical priorities, racial justice, student success, and serving the city uh, is really helpful. It means that we're in the right place doing the right kind of work, right? And we can uh, uh, really drive this forward. And so again, just thinking about resonance, this is what I said when I presented to the board, right? Talking about the inequities um, that existed before COVID and what COVID has done is revealed it, amplified it, and accelerated a lot of the technological processes, right? And so, uh, Provost Jeffords was talking about uh, a lot more folks uh, interested in flexible workplaces and remote work. There are lots of things around uh, um, technological disruptions that have been uh, accelerated because of COVID. But also, I mean, I, I, when we look back, we cannot talk about this time without talking about the renewed focus on racial justice. Uh, and I just also have to say that the challenge with that is that the cost of entry, right? The price of entry is too high. It is always when there's death and there's violence that we pay attention. And that is that that that's too high a price, right? To focus on this. But the the I don't know if I could say silver lining, that just sounds totally inappropriate. But there really is a sense that we have permission, right? So focus on racial justice. Equity has become like diversity. It is a floating signifier. It means everything and absolutely nothing. Uh, and so the ability to say racial justice and be clear about what it means, what we're hearing more and more from BIPOC individuals is that they really don't like the term BIPOC. And so we don't have a different term, so I'm gonna keep using it, but that they really don't appreciate it. What folks want to have the opportunity to do is focus on kind of affinity communities, be culturally specific and allow for kind of the complexities that exist within that. Um, and then to do the work for real, like, so if there is an increased commitment and increased conversations about it, then we are able to do real work. And sometimes that work is not always comfortable or palatable, but that we have some permission to be able to lean in and do it, right? And again, thinking about the next normal, which is not going to be like returning, right, back to how it was pre-COVID. And so all of these things that we've heard from our wonderful speakers in these conversations that uh, um, Sally and uh, uh, Laura have convened. So folks are retiring, right? We, there, there's gonna be, we need more and more leaders at the table, but we also need new and different leadership capacities. The displacement of jobs, automation, and uh, but, but what I appreciated from the folks reminding us from these um, uh, webinars is that jobs will be lost, but jobs will also be created, right? But the jobs that will be created will require have a higher level of skill and education and capacities, right? And so intentionally leaning into that 
shout out to my uh, colleague, Jamie Scurry, who leans into like thinking about these color economies, blue, silver, rainbow, green, but the kind of blue has kind of superseded green. And what does it mean to engage in these? Uh, because these are both our present and our future. So it was Jefferson leaned into this very hard, right? Uh, change in learning and, and, and work, ways of working, ways of knowing, growth and gig work, all of these things, right? intersect, complexity, increased place of change, they all intersect with equity and racial justice work. And again, I'll keep saying the future and the thriving of BIPOC communities. So this is what I, this is what I promised, uh, this is what I committed to, or this is what I, I, I said at the board meeting. And again, so it was just really good to go back to it, but I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and what I, I talked about kind of getting some inspiration from the corporate world, right? And so, when corporate, everybody, organizations all across the country, higher ed, corporate, people were leaning into racial justice in new ways last summer. But what really got my attention from the corporate world was they were not promising that they were gonna do a whole bunch of anti-racist training, nothing wrong with that. I wanna be clear about that. What they, would, what they focused on was wealth building in minoritized communities, right? And so they looked at this racial wealth gap and they were like, look, we're gonna use the assets that we have and we're gonna come alongside minoritized businesses, right? We're gonna support BIPOC uh, uh, businesses. We're gonna ensure that there's wealth building happening in BIPOC communities. I was like, yes! There's not like there's anything wrong with any of the other, uh, other things that we do. I think all are needed. This was a very intentional kind of different focus that I chair. And so just kind of thinking about what our version of that was, uh, well, that's where kind of the, the promises came from. Right, and so really kind of increasing the college participation or attendant rates of BIPOC folks, right? There is no such thing as too many people in a community are going to college, uh, you know, and I, I appreciate Sally's intro and kind, kind of the future of higher education and all these conversations about ROI and all of that. But if you look at the projections, right, as we continue to diversify, um, college attendance rates, if they don't shift, some BIPOC communities will actually decline, right? And Black and Indigenous communities especially. And shout out to the president of our, of our foundation, Sarah Schwartz, because I was talking to her earlier in the week and I said, you know, this, is, this, this was one of the most meaningful things that I've ever done in my career. And because we had that conversation, I brought it here. But when these, Nathan Graw, who does all of these uh, uh, projections about like high school graduates and, 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 what, uh, and what that would look like in the future, usually to 2030, I think they're moving beyond that. But when it, Nathan Graw first was getting all of this attention because of the pro uh, projections and talking about the demographic cliff, you know, he was doing kind of the national tour and talking about this. And um, so I was sitting at a conference and he presented this. And there were people hearing this for the first time, this piece about some communities will actually decline on college campuses because the national conversation had been focusing on the fact that white college students, traditional A college students would decline. And that was an economic conversation. And so folks had not really paid any attention to the BIPOC folks. And I told her, you know, I was like, I was incredibly moved uh, by a woman who got up. She was hearing this information for the first time. And she said with everything she had, she said, I will not accept this. Like she was like, no, 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 I'm not going to accept this. And they said, Ross said, look, demography does not have to be destiny, right? We get so that we can do something about this, right? But we have to act. And so I was really moved. Well, because one first I was like, oh, wow, folks don't know, right? And so again, it was like, oh, do folks know what's coming? Um, and and what, I, so what I did when I got back was I brought kind of BIPOC community members to the table and I showed them the data. I was like, here's what the pro projections are saying what are you going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? But really, right? And there were some very intentional. So we got an alumni of color chapter because of that conversation, because, you know, alum, alums wanted to make sure that they were part of, of the access and success pipeline. And then we got a, a corporate uh, partnership that was focusing on increasing college participation rates. So it's something that I believe in, you're going to hear me say this multiple times, that we need to come alongside communities but if access, Sally was talking about access to information, access to projections, right? We need to make sure that the communities that are gonna be impacted have access to this information and have access to, you know, they get to, they have agency in terms of making decisions about their future. So all of the conversation, shout out to Provost Jeffords and the work that's happening with Students First. Uh, shout out to Diversity and Multicultural Services and the work that is happening there. We wanna make sure that we are supporting the retention, the graduation, the success of BIPOC students 
I have a bias for high impact practices because of, of the uh, um, what it, the impact it has on minoritized folks. It benefits all students, but it really, really benefits uh, uh, minoritized students. And these habits of mind that are really important for the future, shout out to Mr. Flores, uh, and really kind of thinking about career readiness. Um, but you know, thinking about our employee, our students, our employees impact our students. So we also want our minoritized uh, employees to stay. But what they're telling us, we, they want access to opportunities to develop. They want ac access to advancement. So also making sure that we're building the infrastructure that supports that. And then kind of the conversations we've been having around kind of corporate engagement and civic engagement. What does that look like if we're pooling our resources, if we have a shared agenda, uh, and then we're really kind of driving towards clear impact that supports the thriving of BIPOC communities. And so the opportunity, again, to, I was gonna say empower, but that just, I, yeah. The opportunity to come alongside and support the self-determination, the agenda setting and the agency of BIPOC communities, right? There is cultural wealth, there is nuance in, 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 in cultures and communities that I don't know. I can't know another person's story. I just can't, right? I, might, I, I listen, I try to immerse myself, but I'm not gonna see all of the pieces and all of the texture about somebody else's story. That's just the way it works. So what I need to do is come alongside a person who knows all of those things, right? Or has access to all of that insider knowledge. And so when we talk about BIPOC-centered and BIPOC-led, that's what we're talking about. Um, it could, what we really want is like a, just kind of a vibrant intellectual, cultural, spiritual, uh, into, um, there's one more word, something, intellectual, cultural, and spiritual life, right? It just, folks need to, when they're here, they need to feel like they're able to take up space. They need to feel like they're seen. They need to feel like they're celebrated. And that's what we want for our students when they go to organizations. And so the partnerships that they have, we have with organizations to support that will be really, really important. So, you know, it's really easy to kind of throw that off in five minutes, right? A lot of work to do, right? We really have to build an infrastructure to do the work. It's not going to happen over, overnight. I'm so grateful for all of the partners at the table, people who are thinking about it, you know, and then I took this piece, little shout out to the, the cohorts in Intercultural U. Um, we get to look at a Pepsi case study. And I, so I took this piece from there um, and it just says, you know, we got there very painfully. And that's why a lot of folks don't do it. It's hard work. If you're gonna do this work, it's gonna be uncomfortable sometimes. It's gonna be difficult sometimes. You're gonna fail sometimes. And we have to keep pushing forward, right? Because all change, any kind of real change is painful. It's interrupting something that's normative or interrupting some sort of a, a status quo. And DEI, because this is something that we wanna be good at, this is something that we care about because this is about identity. It can be especially hard uh, to do a real change when it comes to DEI. And then Jean's gonna uh, share some thoughts later. Shout out to uh, uh, Jean and the conversation we were having at PSU Next around immunity to change. So we have to look at places where, you know, if we, what it feels like is that we have our foot on the gas and the brake at the same time. We're saying, we wanna do this, we wanna do this, but actually there are things that keep stopping us from doing it, right? And so the, the uh, ability to unpack that becomes really important. So we want to also make sure that we're doing the things that are clear and easy to understand, the things that are technical, not always quick wins, but people can identify technical work. Adaptive work is a little harder, right? And requires a kind of transformational learning and kind of a change in relationships. We want to make sure that we're doing both because if you're going to get to sustainable change, you need to do both. Um, the fact that a lot of things that are taking as kind of normal or right or regular actually support inequity and injustice is something that we need to unpack as we do the work. And then one of the things that attracted me, I know attracted a lot of you to PSU is our demographics, right? And then Kimberly's talking as a non-traditional student, we just have, an, a, we have the world represented, right? The complexity of the world represented in our student body and opportunities to continue to lean into that is what I really look forward to. And so because this is hard, this is long, um, because it's not linear, we have to be clear about what we're trying to do, right? What's our vision for success? Um, and for me, and this is my bias, it is really is about the thriving of BIPOC communities. Because as you think about demographic shifts, and as you think about just kind of who we want to be in the country, in the world, and the thriving of BIPOC uh, of communities benefits all of us, right? So it's the way in, that's, I'm very clear that the way in, I, in terms of how I'm positioned, is through BIPOC communities, but there's benefits to the whole. I'm also very clear about that, right? And so again, going back to our, our intercultural youth folks, 
we read the letter from the Birmingham jail in that space. And what folks, we had just had our last final meeting for group two uh, on Monday, congratulations. Uh, folks kept saying that the challenge is that the letter reads like it could have been written last week. It feels super present. And so that means if 50 and 60 years from now, I said my daughter, my daughter is seven. So when my daughter is 57 or 67, and she, we, if we want her to read that letter and it not feel like it could have been written last week, then that means we've got to get to work, right? We actually have to do things to change the future. So I thank you. We can, we can convene conversations and we can act. And I think PSP is perfectly positioned for this. And I'm super excited uh, to work with colleagues all across campus to make this happen. And thank you for the space. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Lambert. I would like now to uh, have Greg Flores um, speak to our, our group. Thanks, I'm glad to be here today. Thank you very much. Um, I had a lot of thoughts after watching the webinars. Um, this is stuff that I like to dive into anyway, but the, the way that these were structured and kind of flowed into each other um, really spoke to, to a lot of things. Um, one of the big threads that struck me across the first couple of webinars was this idea of the importance of good jobs um, and the, the access uh, or the decline of kind of what are middle income or middle skill jobs. Um, and that, that definition of what is a good job and what is a, a bad job, so to speak. And something Dr. Lambert just said about the way the system works, the way it's set up, there are problems. It's, it's a, a racist and biased system by nature. And we see that in the racial gap in income and access to jobs and access to education. And one of the things that struck me is the idea, the first speaker talked about how we don't just need to tell people to upskill, to, to retrain for a, a different job to improve their station. We need to work on upgrading jobs as well. So we have a lot of jobs that are out there that are undervalued, underpaid, underappreciated work. And a lot of that work falls to our racial communities. Uh, and the key for building racial wealth, like Dr. Lambert said, we need to, we need to improve the, uh, the state of those jobs. Now, the job itself is going to exist. We need people to do that work. We need to value that work as important. And I'm talking about things like home health care aids, CNAs, those, those entry level or what are considered entry level positions. Um, but that takes dedication, takes skill to be successful in those jobs and just as as a system, those jobs are undervalued and underpaid. Um, and a lot of the students I see in career counseling are students who have jobs like that and they like the work they're doing. They like the impact they have, the difference they get to make, um, but what they don't like the compensation. They don't like the precarity of it. They wanna know that they're gonna be okay. They want a job that has um, what, they what they define as a good job, jobs that have, um, uh, reliable schedules, reliable pay. Uh, they have job security. You know the job's going to be there for you. And it's hard because the bar for a good job doesn't seem that high. A job that, that respects me as a human, that gives me a schedule I can rely on, that pays me enough to live. It doesn't seem like that should be too much to ask. And I really, it bothers me sometimes that that's how it feels. Like that, that that's asking a lot out of work um, to kind of reach that bottom bar. Um, so one of the things for me, I think that. Um, when I think about the uncertainty of the, of the future of work and all of the change that's happening, the technological change, the, the nature of work, um, the, the rise of the gig economy and, and all of that, um, there's two things that stand out to me as kind of really areas where, where we're already doing some work at PSU and we also have an opportunity to do more. So a big one for me that I came across in the first couple of webinars, especially the second one, was the idea of, um, finding a sense of purpose in work or pursuing uh, purpose, both for individuals and for organizations. So there's, there's write, writing out there. Um, there's a book called The Purpose Economy by Aaron Hurst that talks about kind of when you have purpose-driven individuals, when you can help someone tap into that sense of purpose and purpose being something that's separate from passion. passion you can be really passionate about something like knitting, but not want to make that your career. Um, you can have a rich hobby life, you can have things that you care about and you can decide whether or not you want that to be a part of your career. And if you have that passion and a desire to make a part of your career, that can be a sense of purpose. But a lot of people are, are motivated by the things that they care about, by finding things that um, 
that, that are important to them. Um, so when I'm meeting with students and I'm doing career counseling, one of the questions I like to ask is, you know, what is a problem you want to solve or what is a difference you want to make uh, to see if that resonates with students. And um, some students are focused a little closer. They're, they want to, um, uh, they're, they're worried about those good job qualities, the security. They want to know that they're going to be okay. Um, and they, they want those needs met first before they start thinking about the difference they're going to make, how they're going to serve their community, um, what, what are problems out there that, that they can use their strengths and their skills to help solve. Um, and I think we have a real opportunity and kind of built into the structure of our schooling with the community-based learning, with the capstones for people to explore that sense of purpose, to help identify things that they care about, um, problems that need help and differences that they can make along the way. And why I think that's really important, I think the real, the real value of having that sense of purpose is that with all the things that are changing, with all the advances in technology, with all the automation and the changes that are already happening and we know are coming, if we have that sense of purpose, if a student can say, this is what matters to me, um, this is a problem I know I wanna help fix, um, and I'm gonna find a way to make this part of my career, they always have a guide. They always have a, a, a guiding light or a, a direction to head. So despite all those changes, despite the, the ups and downs of the economy of the changing world of work, if they know why they're doing it, then upskilling, retraining, moving on to a different perspective to, to do that work, they have that, that anchor that holds them, that you know, keeps them afloat in the tide. I'm mixing my metaphors, I apologize. Uh, so, and that, like I said, that idea of telling a student, uh, a first gen student who, um, is worried about you know meeting their family expectations, about supporting themselves, about finding that the return on investment of their degree to follow their passion doesn't really resonate. Um, students who are more community minded, students who who can see the problems in the world around them, asking them what do you want to do about it is, is a much more effective way of connecting with that student or helping them see the value of what they're pursuing. Um, and we need both. There are students that are motivated in different ways, but that's just, just an area we've seen success is when um, helping people identify that passion. Um, the other piece with that for me personally is when I'm talking to someone who is clearly privileged, who's had advantages, who has the ability to go out and do whatever they want to take those risks, I want to also push them to ask those same questions to say, you have this benefit, you have this ability to change, to help change change. How can you use that to better your community, to serve in some way? Um, sometimes that goes over well, sometimes it doesn't. Um, the second thing is that the, the second speaker was talking about kind of the essential skills for success in the future of work. And those skills, um, the, like uh, Provost Jeff, Jeffords talked about, those, those human skills, um, I think they talked about empathy, curiosity, creativity, imagination, courage, those are all things that are kind of baked into our core at PSU. That's what we want students to get out of their educational experience, especially their university studies. I think students get a lot of exposure to that. They have a lot of practice in building those skills. I think they just have a really hard time articulating that and translating that experience into a way that makes sense for themselves and a way that makes sense to, to share that story with an employer or with an organization that they, they wanna be a part of. So I think one of the areas that we have um, where we can do better is helping students translate that experience. Um, and I think a, a part of that is also helping students recognize the value of that experience. Um, I think we talk about the idea that we don't want students to graduate with a degree that's already out of date. But if we can help students understand that, that part of what they've learned here is they've learned how to learn. They can, they can tackle a 10 week class and, and absorb and digest and reflect on that information quickly. They, they've done that over and over again as a student. Um, but they help, we have to help them see the transferability of that, that skill, that they can take that skill with them and use that in another environment. I think another way that plays out in my interactions with students is that a lot of students undervalue their experience or they feel like they should be applying for a job fully formed that they, they see these job descriptions that ask for the moon. Um, sometimes I'll tell, tell job uh, postings a Mary Poppins list. They put in every possible thing they might possibly want out of a candidate because they don't actually know what they need. 
Um, and students are, see that and they, they find it hard to live up to. How, do you, how can one person possibly have all of this um, for a job that is technically an entry level job that requires five years of experience? All, all those things that frustrate everyone looking at job descriptions. Um, what I, I find a lot of joy in helping students kind of recognize that, that they've built a foundation with their degree, that they, they've learned how to, to learn, like I said, They've and they found a passion or a, a interest. They found something that they care about, that they want to learn more about, and that's what they can say to an employer. They can say, "This is what." Instead of saying, "All I know is this," or "All I've had, all, the only experience I have is this," recognizing that as this is how far I've come. This is what I've learned already, and this is the foundation for my continued learning and my continuing growth with your organization. And helping students believe that story, to, to own that story for themselves is one of the challenges that we face um, when we're working with students in the Career Center. Um, and helping a student kind of confidently share the value of their learning, the value of their experience from internships, from jobs they've had, whatever it is, um, is one of the things that we focus on in working with students as they head out into the world of work. Um, so that idea that their degree is, is a foundation or a launch pad to help them move forward is an important thing that, that is a, a reframe. It's not the way students normally think of their degree. They think of it, they finished, they're ready to go, or they should be ready to go, not that they're going to continue learning, they're going to continue building skills. They're going to use those learning skills that they gain to build those skills up over time. So I think there's a lot of good work already happening at PSU, but there's a, a step in there that we, that we don't do enough of, and that's helping students really make that connection and translate it for them. And I think that we can do that with career-related learning outcomes, um, scaffolding more career development into the experience um, as students learn and grow throughout their time. Um, another thing that Dr. Lambert said was about helping students understand those hidden expectations. Um, and Part of that is all the things I'm talking about are really opt-in. It's up to the student to find the career center and to, to come and get the, to train on those skills. They have to know to look for them. And the more we can build that experience into the student's curriculum, the more it's unavoidable, the more students we can reach, the more we can unco uncover those hidden, you know, that hidden curriculum, those hidden expectations for all of our students. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, I so appreciate uh, your, your uh, contribution. And we're going to now jump to uh, Laura Nissen um, for our final um, uh, commentary. Okay. Are you hearing me okay? Great. Um, well, I just want to say this is awesome. Thank you, everybody. And I want to just share as I get going um, a little something from an exercise we've done this year in the collaboratory where we were exploring metaphors and motive, how metaphors shape really the way we work and, and they shape our aspirations as well. And we had this um, lengthy engagement where we were really talking about how we want PSU to feel less like a machine and more like a coral reef, less mechanistic and more like an ecosystem. And I share this, a thriving, colorful, diverse ecosystem. I share it because um, I really, I, I want to say, I think the future of work is an ecosystem, is an ecosystem mindset is the right way to go here. The future of work is an epic story. It's a story about equity, human fulfillment and identity, the economy, politics, education, and also learning. Because it's the future of learning isn't just about taking a class, obviously. We're seeing all kinds of ways that's getting disrupted. So what kind of story will PSU tell? I, I found all the speakers to be super inspiring and, and generative in terms of making me think more about it. I think as an institution, we have to keep navigating and managing the tensions between the future of work and the future of higher education. And we've got to really tackle that collision that so often happens. I think we need a bigger story where education and the future of work enhance one another and frankly, enhance our goals for social mobility, um, equitable distribution of good jobs and income, et cetera. The future of work won't become easier and it won't go away. It's, it's likely gonna get more intense. So as massive transition and developments are possible, 
um, also ma massive transitions and developments are very possible. So the things that are both very po positive and very scary in this space. For example, I mean, we saw all kinds of things this last year around guaranteed income or other kinds of build outs of you know, new kind of work development mindsets and social welfare development mindsets that would, be, would have been unthinkable a few years ago. None of these things will happen without dialogue about power, structural considerations, structural violence, racism, et cetera, workers' rights, the responsibilities of business and government um, in all of these processes. So I think PSU, I think we have, a, we have to take our place. And Ami, this really builds on, on something you said. We are a vital part of the emerging future of work ecosystem in our region. We're also the 10th largest employer in the state of Oregon, by the way. So the future of, of work is really a big deal just for us as well. Sort of imagining um, and building what it would look like to embrace our place without compromising our academic integrity or focus to say, yes, we can build a narrative that's big enough to say we both prepare humans to take their place in the future of civilization and society, but we also prepare people for work. Um, when I think of Marie Conway's wonderful question that challenges in higher ed to move away from the, what do we need to do to stay alive distractions to the bigger question of what does the future need most from us? I think of this issue in particular. Um, I think this, this, the future needs us to be more ready, more focused, more effective, and more of a leader on this particular issue. So both for the Futures Collaboratory and beyond, I, I hope that we can have a dedicated future of work effort at the university each year, sort of to keep this dialogue healthy and growing um, uh, throughout our academic community. Um, I think we have to stay connected and find innovative ways to increase our ability to learn together as a community and then create strategy from that and renew our responses to this topic through the coming years because it's gonna keep changing very quickly. Um, I think there's also an amazing opportunity to listen and learn from our alumni in more robust ways on what's changing out there um, and help us really in this particular way. I think, I think we've under, um, ex ex underdeveloped that particular um, tool and resource. Boy, I really wanna underscore this, amplify the importance of the liberal arts. Oh my gosh, in the Oregon specific uh, presentation, which I thought was great in a lot of ways, but there was so much STEM focus and really no real um, underlining of the nationally and international focus on liberal arts and how important that is, you know, doing things that machines can't do, that very human um, part of uh, the future of work. In, in a world that will be increasingly tech-centered, people skills and broader knowledge will matter more than ever. And then braid all of our activities in equity, student success, faculty development, and other topics. The last thing I wanna say is that I really think there's a political public affairs agenda here for PSU too. Many jobs will go away in the years to come and many others will be created. I believe PSU needs to be an active presence in the conversations and spaces where decisions are being made on these topics. We have a role to play to contribute, advise, provide input, and making sure also at, through advocacy that education is part of that, uh, part of that plan and funded. Um, so I think we need to increase our presence in statewide decision making and agenda shaping on this issue, creating spaces for equitable futures of work to be prioritized, challenging our electeds to take bold and intentional actions to be proactive, have long term vision about the future of work means to the future of our economy, the electorate and well being. Um, the biggest thing I took away from all of this was from Dr. Chatta as well. Sounds like he had a big influence on all of us. Good jobs will not just happen on our own. We have a role to play in assisting this and preparing our students to operate and succeed in these new ecosystems. And we as a university, I think, have a role to shaping that agenda. So um, just, just want to do a shout out to the web page we put together for um, for this effort, um, which we'll share with you uh, while we jump into questions. Um, but I think um, I just really want to say um, organizing uh, what, what I'm taking away, I'm going to just stop sharing this. 
um, what I'm taking away from um, this activity is actually quite a bit more work um, to organize uh, other state level efforts on, and I've actually been pulling together model legislation. What have other states been doing to sort of set forth future of work legislation? And how do we, um, how do we help promote that kind of activity in our elected officials? Um, and, and really help PSU become a hub of energy and vital creative ideas and activities. So that's what, that was my big takeaway is to really turn to our state legislature and saying, this is, these are giant ecosystem issues that we do have control over. And then PSU to really take our place in that ecosystem at this higher level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you to all four panelists for your amazing contributions and observations. I am just blown away about how much the future of work is about advocacy and about developing our human uh, strengths. Um, so, but in any case, I want to make sure that we have time for questions. If you have a question, please post it in our Q&A um, chat. And uh, right now I'm going to turn it, the, uh, it over to Jeannie Enders, who's our faculty uh, response person. And she's gonna just post some questions that, um, to the panelists and, and uh, get the discussion going. So Jeannie. Oh, thank you. And then we wanna be sure Kimberly, our student representative here has time as well to respond. Um, wow, you guys, you know, this is kind of intimidating because of all the rich ideas and the deep work, um, all of us having listened to and been a part of um, the conversations as spectators in, in the previous sessions and then your new ideas and collected ideas today. I think I'm curious most um, about in the first session, there was discussion about how does a person who's done all the things society told them to do, um, invested in their education, sitting with large debt and that kind of thing, and now working in a low wage job, you know, how do they make sense of this circumstance? You know, what narrative, what mental model are they experiencing and building? And um, I'm really haunted by that and kind of uh, uh, stuck with that. And I think a lot of your comments were uh, really um, also struck by this injustice that we see. So I was thinking about, you are all talking about things that we can do in higher ed to create conditions for more justice in general. And I think we also mean more flourishing and thriving. And it just made me think like, what, when we teach ways of knowing and ways of being to students, are we living those ways of knowing? Like what's our personal responsibility and maybe um, to contribute to those conditions and which are practices that we may or may not be doing ourselves to both model and live into a new narrative or a new future. And so, I don't know, that's a little convoluted, but my question to each of you is, what would be one step, you know, people invested in the work of higher education, what is one behavior, one practice, one action that we could be doing today to contribute to a new narrative and a vision of a just and flourishing future for all? I have this effect on students too, where they're like, what, what are you asking? <laughs> so sorry, everyone. But I mean, maybe it's something super personal or, or not, right? Like more policy oriented, but okay. Sorry that my questions are weird. I'll just, I mean, I can start in by just saying, I think um, these are very overwhelming. These, these can be very overwhelming issues. So the practical thing, I think I want students and faculty and staff and administration to all feel at this university is a sense of agency. The future isn't set. We shape it and we can be up against big powerful forces, but I just want, I mean, I, I think the, the future is up to, um, up to our collective effort. And so I want people to feel a sense of agency that shaping the future is not only something we should do, but something we can do um, together. And it, it's better if we do it together. That's what I would say. Others? 
I have a re response, and it's based on some of this is based on other presentations that I've heard from Christian Kaler. Um, so one of the things I struggle with is how much of this information to share with students. If we look at Portland, Portland metro area, uh, about 50% of the population have a bachelor's degree or higher. Only about 35% of the jobs require a bachelor's degree or higher. So that underemployment that you were talking about is prevalent in Portland. Of those jobs that require a degree, about a third of them are in sales, customer service, or administrative support. They're working in cubicles. And so one of the things that where I think it will be heard, where I'm not going to hurt a student, I will say, you know, that's, that's the reality of the current job market, especially students who don't really have an idea of what they want. Uh, if you don't want to work in a cubicle, we have to figure out what it is that you want to do. What is the difference you want to make? How do you want to use your skills? What is an environment that is a better fit for who you are? Because the default is a cubicle in a big office building. That's where the majority of the work lives. So if that's not what we want, then we need to look for something better and something different. Um, so that's, that's a shorter version of a speech that I give fairly regularly. Thank you. Any other comments from our panelists? I think the only thing I would quickly say is, um, you know, it's about making a just future. Um, making explicit the processes that are invisible any way we know them right whatever whatever part of the hidden curriculum in the workplace and the and higher education that we know make it explicit so. well i mean i'm really glad you said that i was the comment i was thinking of making and now i can um, follow your lead here is that part of our responsibility is to pull aside the curtain and show what's behind. I think about, you know, an iconic study that was done, I think maybe even almost 20 years ago now asking, you know, trying to figure out why so many um, female students were dropping out of science classes, undergraduate science majors. And the, one of the key classes, organic chemistry, was a real dividing point where people, you could just see the numbers plummeting. And so there were the researchers, thank God for social science researchers, went and actually asked people what they thought and didn't just look at the outcomes. And it was about expectations and managing expectations. So while the male students went into it pr primarily thinking, I've heard this class is really hard and it's critical to my future, to my being able to move on and go to medical school or do whatever. And all I have to do is get a C and I pass it. And then I, the door is wide open to me, but all I need is a C. The female students not being part of that little inner circle were like, I've heard this class is really hard and it's really pivotal. So I'm gonna have to get an A, right? And if I don't get an A, that means I don't belong. And so they would take a female student who got a B, a male student who got a B. The male student's like, man, I just nailed this thing. I am great. I have a great future ahead of me. The female student is, I failed. I didn't cut the, I couldn't pass the bar. I'll have to switch majors. So they had exactly the same behavior, but they didn't understand the secret signals about what their behavior was tied to and what the future expectations would look like. That happens every single day for our students about what their degree means to them. What does it mean to get a bachelor's degree? We have, and Greg, you see this all the time. We have so many students who are working in service jobs that don't require a bachelor's degree, but they have those jobs in hand. They get their bachelor's degree and they stay in those jobs because nobody has pulled the curtain aside to them to say, do you know all the other things you can do? And it feels safe to stay in that job. And nobody has said, here's the world ahead of you. Let's pull the curtain aside so you can see what it really looks like and how to get there. And that's our job is to disclose that hidden curriculum, those hidden, the handshakes, the signals. Actually, our job is to destroy the handshakes and the signals and to disrupt the system that, that in which they are embedded. And we have to do that internally at the institution as well. But that is, 
if we can't get that work done, we're not really helping our students by just getting them a degree. Wow. Thank you, Susan. Um, I would like to now give some uh, time uh, to our student panelist, a respondent, Kim Valentine, who I think kind of represents all of these issues that we were just talking about. Um, so Kim, I'm going to turn the, the floor over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to be a little selfish on my questions. So um, I was Googling to try to find out what the age demographic was at Portland State. And so I don't know if my numbers are correct, but I found just 29% of the students at Portland State are 18 to 21 compared to the national average of 60%. We're diverse. We have ages all over the place. And I'm wondering if you're looking, or what I'm not hearing is whether or not we're looking at whether or not age is a factor and how we can adjust for that. How do we face the future? I know as an accounting major, I'm often told that the traditional jobs that everybody wants that I will have a hard time getting. But what I can't get is an understanding of what those jobs are that are for me and how do I go after those jobs. And so I'm just wondering, are, are you looking at that or is there something that we can do to help ourselves or advocate for ourselves or what are your findings? Great question. Yeah. Well, I, um, I want to invite Vice President Lambert to step in here because I, I'm going to mention a topic on which I know she has thought an incredible amount, which is that of mentoring. I think that there are mentoring structures that we could improve that would go a long way towards um, supporting students in precisely the ways that you have mentioned here, um, making those connections being able to share and present your skills and expertise in ways that um, match the, the the interests that employees have. But uh, Dr. Lambert, I'm going to defer to you because I know you've had thought so much about this issue. Yeah, I appreciate that very much, but with Jeff, it's, um, yeah, that's, that, that, that is it, right? Like we need networks, right? We need lots of jobs or not. I don't know, I'm, I'm messing with somebody else's territory. So I'm going to bring Greg in very quickly, right? Lots of jobs are not publicly advertised, but I, I think to, to add to what, what was Jeff had said, uh, and I love you, you know, the research that you did and the, the conversation in higher education as the population of traditional age uh, uh, high school graduates declines is adult students, right? So, the, but we have them, right? So we're not gonna go look for those students because they're here. So I actually think that the, the um, narrative and degree completers, right? People who are returning after completing, completing some college. So I actually think that um, you're gonna be less unique as time goes on, right? That, that more, more institutions across the state, across the country are leaning into this. And so employers will expect that, right? They, would, they now will be looking for folks who, as you mentioned in your intro, or Sally mentioned in your intro at midlife or going back and either changing careers or completing their degrees. And so I, I do think that, you know, the bigger story that um, uh, Laura was talking about, like who is a college student, right? Norming that larger story that it is not just 18 to 22 year olds uh, is really important. I would just throw in that I think this is all gonna be, I think we're gonna, ed higher education is going to become more and more and more an ecosystem where people are coming in and going out a lot and universities of the future are really figuring out how to say everyone is a learner, that the, the, the future of work and the future of success means learning and relearning in an ecosystem um, in varying degrees of formal and informal ways. And so I think for PSU to position itself in that way um, is really important. Um, I think that's a great question. I do also think for faculty to hear I think students are more and more, like I've been to a number of events where there was a lot of discussion about the very question Kimberly asked, 
I think students are wanting that from their faculty. They're wanting answers on those kinds of questions more and more from their faculty. Um, and so that's just something for us as faculty to know that is, is a real felt student need, um, which means we have a different kind of obligation to keep up on what's changing. I think, or we can work on building exploration of that change into the curriculum, making that yeah. a part of the, what we drive the students to do or what we're sharing with them, especially near the end of their education. Yeah, well said. It makes I, that, oh, oh, I just want to say, I think that really means that, you know, faculty need to commit to their own lifelong learning. So um, I will never be an expert in artificial intelligence, but am I consistently growing in ways that mean my ways of knowing are more and more current and helpful to students like Kimberly? Kimberly, do you have anything else you'd like to ask from the student perspective? No, thank you very much, though. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a couple of questions from the open uh, Q&A, and I'm going to go to um, Harold McNaren's question. And his question is, how might the BIPOC-led racial justice efforts of the Port Portland Clean Energy Fund inform our city's future of work? How is B PSU building on the success of PCEF? And I. I'm not familiar with that, but maybe somebody um, on the, the panel is. So um, Harold, that's my invitation. Please uh, clue us in. So uh, I don't know why, why are you more connected? You got here after I did. But uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, would, I would love to learn more and, and find opportunities to connect because I'm not familiar. Um, then I'm going to, uh, we have an anonymous attendee question asking, how can PSU as an employer be an example of valuing the work of its employees, especially classified staff and academic professionals? As one of the largest employers in Oregon, it seems like PSU has a real opportunity to make a positive impact on our overall economy. Anyone wanting to respond to that? I do just think, I mean, from where I sit in the Futures Collaboratory, we have had conversations over the years about just the future of work in our own institution and what that means and how much control people feel like they have over it and what their traditional, you know, um, handles are, levers are to, to deal with that. And um, I just think we need more of that. I think we need more of those conversations. The future of work as Susan said, it's not, it's not out there. The future of work is at PSU. We are experiencing it. And we are experiencing it in, in, in different levels. Some parts of it are forces way bigger than us. Um, some of it are forces we have control over. I think we have to have deeper and more focused conversations about controlling the things we can and then using our full power to focus on the things that we maybe can't control, but we could impact. Um, so that's my thoughts about it. I just think we ought to have forthright, clear conversations about what does the future work, work mean in our own institution. Any other comments? I have one more question from the chat before I go to that. Does anyone want to say anything? Because we're running close on time here. It's, it's time flies when you're always talking about things that are important. Um, so Angela Hamilton has posted the question, I'd like to hear what the panelists think about creating more on-campus student employment opportunities. Um, I don't think I'd read the whole thing. In a way that, oops, <laughs> in a way that just isn't a job but develops more agency in career literacy. Oh, Laura, you were answering that. I don't know. I, I don't think I was. Okay. <laughs> I think I hit the wrong thing, but okay. else may have a better answer than that. Well, I have, uh, this is an issue on which I feel very passionate. I think it is in our interest in, in supporting our students to create more on-campus jobs. 
it's not simply a uh, a way to think about employment, but it's a way for students to continue to be engaged in the kind of mentoring that happens across the university, no matter where you work, so that all faculty and staff in this way become mentors to all of our students in thinking about shaping futures and shaping careers. And so for students to be constantly engaged in those kinds of conversations with folks around them who are saying, what are your future plans? What are you thinking of doing? How can we help you get there in a way that it's not always the case that other employers are are asking those questions or supporting uh, students in thinking more broadly and ambitiously about their futures. So I think to the extent that we can, creating more opportunities for students to be employed on campus, we know that the vast majority of our students need to work while they are going to school, better that they work at the university than um, in a lot of other employment locations. At a very simple level, you need somebody who understands when you say, I can't work that day, I have an exam to study for. How easy is that, right, for us, as opposed to somebody who's outside the university? Yeah, I'll add, I think we have about 2,000 student employees. I haven't checked the numbers recently, but that's pretty typically what it is. So there, there is a, a fair amount of opportunity. Um, but some of our friends and neighbors or schools to the south have a lot more. There's, there's more student jobs there in part because of athletics and residential. Um, but I think for the jobs we do have, and if we can have the opportunity to create more jobs, that would be amazing. But we also have an opportunity to elevate the jobs we have. Um, if we could make it so that we had learning outcomes required for jobs, uh, so that student, we are ensuring that student experience, we're elevating that experience. It's not just a job. You're not just going to show up and um, you know, sit at the desk or whatever the, the role is that you're, we're going to actively work to make sure you're getting something out of this experience. And that includes the mentorship, Provost Jeffords was talking about, um, skills that they can articulate and put on their resume that they can take with them to another job. Um, and, uh, that sense of community and belonging and connection to the campus. I think there's a lot of power in that. And in past years, we've done a survey of student employees and that's what the students have said that, that having that job on campus helped them stay in school, to help them graduate, um, help them clarify career goals, whether it was, I don't wanna do this forever, or I can see myself doing this kind of work, or this, this work is helping me prepare for my career. One thing that I've really seen a lot of in my own field is a lot of um, shadowing people um, that we, um, you know, the old, the old thing, the old frame of reference was everybody should do an internship and a study abroad. That's what I was told. If you want to get the most out of your degree, do those two things. And I think now what I'm seeing is an unpacking of those. Um, you know, we have COIL now, we have uh, virtual internships, but wouldn't it be cool um, to have more opportunities for our students to like shadow people that are in the fields that they, they want to go into in a more kind of I'm sure that we're doing it, but maybe even on a larger scale. I don't know what, what your thoughts are. I, I, I'm gonna go back to my <coughs> state level work, but I just think it's a great opportunity for advocacy. Stu great student jobs um, are, are a wonderful vehicle to take care of a lot of the other concerns that we all have about student success, and yet we just don't have the resources to do as much of it as we would like. So if, if the state of Oregon values student success, then you know, hopefully, again, we have to just be looking at those bigger levers. And I, I know that um, our foundation is working hard at that, but I just think there's a lot of creative work to potentially do in that space. And who knows, like I say, we could see some really big things changing um, for the better in terms of some federal policy and other kinds of things about this. In that case, where futures thinking really plays a role is would we be ready? If some big opportunity happened to do some huge new thing in this space, would we be ready? So part of futures work, I think is getting our ideas ready to, to launch if we have that moment where something opens up. And, um, but I love that idea. And I, I think more of that is needed at every level. Some universities have whole 
programs, whole sort of co that was the dream of co-op and, and some of that, not only jobs on campus, but jobs in the community as well. And people flowing in and out, you know, getting paid to work in spaces and then coming in to learn and trading off that way. Well, we are running very close to time. Oh, was somebody wanting to make a comment? Nope, thought I heard Jeannie. Um, I apologize for not answering one of the questions, especially from because it's from my boss. <laughs> so hopefully he will um, forgive me. Um, but I wanted to spend these last few minutes actually turning this over to Laura, um, putting her on the spot a little bit about kind of where the futures collaboratory is going next and kind of what what are the different irons in the fire i know that you know we're talking about certificates i know that there's a lot of things that are in flow but kind of how can people how can this audience stay engaged and abreast of of your work well thank you um sally i mean i we're we're ending our second year um, of the collaboratory's work and i'm just actually in the process of sort of writing a report of of the things that we got done this year um i may try to i've in the past i've done a little presentation for faculty senate and certainly will be presenting them to president um the president and the provost um just in terms of what we've done um but um, I, I think there's a number of things that are going on. We're, we're working on, um, on building on some of the ideas that we've had, making spaces for students to get involved in this and pick up curriculum that is specifically focused on this, and then building structures um, for us to continue having these conversations as an institution. Um, the Futures Collaboratory has been, up until this point, kind of a year by year, um, thing and I don't I don't have any I don't have any knowledge of what's going to happen next but I think it's gone well so far so I hope we're going to do it again next year and um, if people on this call are interested as we say we are very much the Hotel California uh, you you could check in but you never check out so once you're in the Futures Collaboratory you're always in the Futures Collaboratory um, and so we're about 60 people strong but we hope to keep growing um, that capacity. I want to be really clear that futures thinking isn't a magic wand. It doesn't fix things. It doesn't remove the obligation to do hard work of, of adapting and recreating ourselves to meet the times that we're in. But um, I think I'm really proud of the both the relationships and the exploring and the work that we've done to think some bigger thoughts. Um, at PSU campus, both bigger in terms of our traditional scope and scale of any one of our jobs, but also the future out and sort of escape this tyranny of short-term thinking and being in an emergency all the time. Um, so with that, I'll, that's, that's what I'll say for now. But I hope if you're, if you're really passionate and interested in getting involved, um, if either you're listening to this live or if you're listening to it on a recording later, um, just email me and let me know if you're interested in getting involved next year. Um, because uh, hopefully we'll be doing something um, related to that. And I do know uh, Provost Jeffers has asked us to put a little training together for the Reimagine PSU, um, some leaders who are gonna be involved in that this summer. So I know we'll be doing um, some more things, but um, Futures Work is not an event, it is a practice, just like equity is not, you know, equity is not an event, it's a practice. And so these are, I think these are the practices of the future. And I love, I'm going to steal something Jeannie has said normally is, I think it's pretty smart university administration that has invested in this and built this capacity for not just fear and worry about the future, but joy and agency. Well, I can't think of a better note to conclude on. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating in this, especially Provost Jeffers, Dr. Lambert, um, Greg Flores, uh, Jeannie Enders, Kim Valentine, of course, Laura. Um, we have generated a ton of interest and excitement, not just uh, in our own community, but across the world. Um, and so I'm hoping that, that we will be beginning many conversations about the future of work and of equity and of well being. So thanks. Thank you to everybody. I just want to really give a standing ovation to you too, Dr. Mudiyamu, and the incredibly heavy lifting you have done to help get this all going. So Sally has been a real force of nature. Thank you. Thanks to our AV support. 
Thanks to everybody. Be well. Yes, be well. Thank you. Bye-bye.